and being nameless ciphers so that there's no victimization, but actually people who are at the center of the tragedy, they become the challenges. And then storytelling, how to make that compelling, creating narratives, and something that then is, um, is uh, both timely and timeless that you hope will linger, that tells stories of people that will be remembered. No yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what, what uh, Ian has said, um, I, I agree with a lot of it, but I don't see why the media cannot do a better job by going back to stories afterwards in the way that uh, you were talking about, Adrian. Um, and I'm always very critical in India, and I say this publicly, of the television media here, who every day, they don't want to follow up even on yesterday's story, they want a new what they call Gotala all the time. Um, <laughs> And I'm very glad that if you look at the Muzaffarnagar riots, for instance, there are papers like the Hindu, for instance, which has published first-class reports of people who have gone back a month later um, and uh, even after that. And I think that's one thing the media really needs to do. As Ian rightly says, news, there has to be an immediacy about news. You can't simply say, I'm not going to tell any, say anything about the Bhopal gas disaster until I've had time to find out about it. it that's a good example. I remember when we went there, um, we had to, one of our prime jobs was to try and find out what had happened. Um, and uh, we couldn't find out because Union Carbide refused to give any information. So we had to say something, and so that led to speculation. Maybe it was wrong of us to speculate but the fact that we had to say something. And you can't get away from that aspect of news, but there's no reason why the media shouldn't also see it as they're responsible to deepen the information they give by going back to stories again. I think every story has a lifespan as well, and that cycle can be far longer than you expect it to be. Absolutely. And mm. I, I remember being um, sent uh, in 1994, my first posting to, uh, to Kashmir, and not understanding any of the bloodshed and the chaos and just being cowed and scared by everything that I saw. And, uh, and it would take 15 years to be able to work out what any of that meant and who Ikwan was and what a renegade really was. And I think that, that idea of being able to come back and back and back and, and invest and then suddenly a story ripens to the point where people come forward and walk out of the, the chaos to tell you something revelatory, that's worth waiting for. Another story that has come back is the Operation Blue Star story, which you were such a part of, and suddenly it's back in the news ever since some declassified documents from United Kingdom government were posted on a website. You're talking about United Kingdom's role in the entire operation. I'm sure you've been asked whether there was any role or not. You just might want to answer that. But my question would be, does it really matter? And if it does, why does it still matter? Well, I, I would say, I agree with you that the United Kingdom involvement or not is what I would call a sidebar story. And very, very briefly, I would just say that um, even if something did happen in February, uh, Operation Blue Star took place in June. The whole situation in the Golden Temple had changed dramatically since then. And um, uh, what I know about Operation Blue Star from being there just almost until it started and then from doing the research and having the input, invaluable input from my friend Satish Jacob, who I wrote the book with, um, makes it absolutely clear to me that the actual operation was nothing like a secret service operation. It was a full-scale uh, military operation. Um, but um, Operation Blue Star is, is a very uh, good example of another thing, that uh, foreign correspondents were banned from going into Punjab after that. And these bans inevitably hit the people who, who impose the ban harder than uh, anyone else in the end. Because if you limit the reach of journalism, then you just uh, lay yourself wide open to rumors. And this is what happened uh, to Indira Gandhi during the emergency by gagging the press the country got swamped with rumors. So a very important, I think, aspect of news for people who are in authority is that if you give access, on the whole, you will get a, f a fair and accurate uh, picture. If you don't give access, you, lay room, uh, you leave room for rumors. And as you all know, 
India is a great country for conversations, and conversations can soon uh, generate into rumor mongering. Very true. <laughs> Very wise words. <laughs> I agree. Adrian, I just, uh, you know, want to go to one of the stories, you know, and fascinating stories that you did on the Pakistan nuclear bombs conspiracy. You know, and there are, of course, all kinds of way information is obfuscated. But tell me, how did you manage to penetrate the sort of diabolical, convoluted, complicated security relationships between United States and Pakistan? Um, well, the result of that was that, um, that we were thrown out of Pakistan for quite a long time. <laughs> we were, uh, we were, if I start at the end, um, we, 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 we were blacklisted, but before we were blacklisted, um, they did a very clever thing. Um, we, we seem to have antagonized a particular section of ISI um, who um, went to the trouble of um, setting themselves up um, as a publishing outfit um, and went to a book fair in New York and uh, got hold of an early manuscript of our book and then uh, began to arrest everyone in it. And we were getting increasingly sort of panic phone calls by people saying, uh, uh, you know, so-and-so's gone and so-and-so's gone. And it really was a horrible experience of feeling that you contaminated everybody, all of your sources. And uh, what had happened essentially was that um, a group around Abdul Qadir Khan uh, felt that they had been sacrificed by the state. And so because they were dissatisfied, they wanted to come forward with stories. And they were led by his wife, um, who uh, was called Henny. You may remember Qadir Khan's wife, the love story that ended up with her living with him in Pakistan. And she kind of corralled all of these people together um, and uh, ended up being a conduit for a remarkable series of meetings that took place all over the country, um, including um, uh, the psychoanalyst who was giving family therapy to Qadir Khan, his wife, and the circle of scientists who were like a family, a dysfunctional family. And, uh, and um, th all of those people subsequently became contaminated by the meetings, which actually raises a difficult question, which is, as an outsider operating in an area, one has so much responsibility not just to find a story, understand it and tell mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. but also to leave safely. Uh, leave safely in a way that your relationships um, can stay intact and that while you are self-satisfied eating your breakfast the next morning, that the people too have a lifespan beyond the story. Yes, so absolutely. it's a complex relationship, you know, absolutely. finding sources, looking after them. Yes. I'd just like to return to something that Mark said about rumor. Um, this is a shameful story, reflects very badly on me, and it's a good example of how not knowing where you are and not knowing enough about it and having censorship on top of that can lead to, in my case, a small personal disaster. Um, I was in, in Delhi in January, February 1977, just after Mrs. Gandhi had called elections. I went to a party one night and I met a woman, now, now dead, alas. And uh, what I was trying to do in a piece about Sanjay Gandhi was to explain the power he had over his mother. This woman said to me, she was a Bengali, she'd just been in Calcutta, she said, you know what they're saying in Calcutta? They're saying the mother is sleeping with the son. Now, um, I went away, I kind of forgot that bit, and then I came to write the piece. It was quite a long piece, it was about 3,000 words long. And um, I came to the section of trying to explain Sanjay's hold over Mrs. Gandhi. And my fingers just touched the keys and a sentence came out. It said there were many gossipy explanations, the most ludicrous of which were blackmail and incest. That was a word I should never have written. I'm, 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 I'm sorry to have written it. But the effect on me was disastrous because my feet didn't touch the ground until I was at Delhi airport <laughs> waiting for a plane to Karachi. <laughs> and um, when I got to Karachi, and even an even more ludicrous thing evolved, which was because I'd been expelled from India and because, it, because Pakistan wished to believe that what I'd written was true, I had a reception committee of many reporters. <laughs> uh, and when I said, look, I, I, you've got it all wrong, I put that in as a ludicrous example of what was not true, but that wasn't believed. <laughs> so it took me a while to come back to India after that, and it's thanks to the late Muraji Desai that I eventually did come back. 
I, I think Muraji Desai is one of the most underestimated prime ministers of this country, and I know a lot of you won't agree. But uh, uh, just before we go, let me just say one other thing about what Ian has said. Um, I think, you know, we do very often actually face problems ourselves, quite frankly, in deciding what we ch can say. What we can say, for instance, as Adrian said, uh, with, uh, without damaging our sources. Um, and in, quite frankly, sometimes, what is rumor and what is fact? It isn't always that easy to sort that out. And a very, very quick story to follow on from India. This was when, Ian, this was when I took a director general of the BBC to see uh, Mrs. Gandhi after the emergency. Um, and when she was back in power, this was, and he asked her how she felt about being out of power and losing the confidence of the people of India, as he put it. She said, oh, I never lost the confidence of the people of India. They were only uh, misled by rumors. And then with a, a very sweet smile, she said, many of them spread by the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> okay, of course, uh, I challenged that. <laughs> one question that I'd like to ask all of you. Uh, is what are your views on the digital revolution? You know, because yesterday we were discussing it's such a double-edged sword that uh, you know there are, of course, you know, there, there's this whole thing about a couple of you know a handful of companies owning so much of our data. You know, there are 12, 13 internet companies owning so much of our data, and God knows doing what with that. But also there are equal and enough instances of you know all kinds of oppressed voices appropriating the internet. Of, you know, hitherto unknown, unheard voices have come up, come up, you know, be it a black feminist or gay and lesbian or whoever, you know. So how do, do, does one negotiate this whole digital media world? Sure. In the, yeah. It's very difficult. I mean, it has all kinds of ramifications, really. But in terms of reporting, uh, good reporting tends to cost money. Um, if you're going to spend time somewhere and talk to people and find things out, that costs money. How do you finance it? Well, what, what the net has done is to make writing free. So if I write something for the net, nobody's paying me to do it. That means I'll be less inclined to be a reporter because it's not a way to earn a living. And I think more and more, although the net has wonderful advantages, in which all kinds of people can express their opinions. I mean, the opinion isn't a problem with the net. It's actually finding things out and checking facts and constructing narratives, as Adrian and Mark do, which are believable. Um, and I think that is going to have possibly a very, very bad effect on journalism. I work for a newspaper every week called The Guardian, and uh, I write a column rather every week for The Guardian. and. Um, it's one of the most successful newspapers in terms of its website in the world. I think it's the third most popular website in the world. But it doesn't make money. Um, and this word monetize, which has become a crucial word when it comes to online reporting or online anything actually, um, The Guardian has not found a way to make money from it. I mean, it, it, advertising to some extent, but that's about the only source of revenue now. I think it is a kind of crisis, actually. I don't know if Adrian would agree, but I think it's a kind of crisis. Um, and, I, you know, people um, ask me when I talk at universities or at uh, colleges and at schools what kind of career you can expect from, uh, from journalism. And I, I really have to pause when I'm asked that because um, when I began, um, there was a structure um, which took you through training. Uh, it was called then NCTJ. You did ridiculous things like shorthand tests, local uh, law reporting, uh, local authorities, and you had a kind of indenture process which uh, took you from the smallest daily newspapers up, if you were lucky enough to get a job on a national newspaper, um, done by your mentors, um, and then you were paid according to your experience and ability, and if you were lucky you got a job as a foreign correspondent, and then really for 10 years you wrote rubbish, and you hoped that after that decade you knew something valuable and you had contacts that might produce good stories. I worry that none of that exists. And uh, um, what there is looking for nothing. Um, when you look on the net, uh, much of the opinion expressed may be uh, exotic, but is it true? Um, is it reliable? What is its function? I worry about that. I, I see so many websites. You know, as someone um, who I didn't know very well um, uh, tweeted something, uh, twittered and tweeted about um, my book, 
And uh, I then met him in Jaipur and uh, saw that he had 986,000 followers. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who he is. Uh, misbalance between the number of people who follow him and he has nothing about the subject that they're writing. And yet they have wonderful opinions. You know, as someone um, who I didn't know very well um, uh, tweeted something, uh, tweeted and tweeted about um, my book. And uh, I then met him in Jaipur and uh, for the first time looked at his Twitter account and saw that he had 986,000 followers. <laughs> and I suddenly <laughs> saw this enormous, I'm not going to tell you who he is, but this enormous uh, misbalance between the number of people who follow him and he has um, uh, no knowledge derived from any actual experience <laughs> and the number of people who follow me, um, which is quite slender and small. So the disbalance I worry about, the point that Ian's making, the lack of payment for great quality journalism and writing provided by people like yourselves and the long careers that you've had, I wonder now when you look at people who are 18 and 19, how will they launch their careers in the subcontinent? <laughs> well, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to come in here for a very personal reason. I was um, uh, recently at a conference in Bombay and Sir Tim Bell, the famous uh, publicist for Margaret Thatcher was there. And he, may, he said something which is so true. He said, the internet is a drain, a sewage drain. He said, you can put anything into it. And, you know, I suffered from this because some of you may well have read an email which has been put on the internet which says these are the thoughts of Mark Tully about Sonia Gandhi. And it has absolutely nothing to do with me at all. I never had anything to do with this email. And yet I cannot tell you how many people have uh, sent me emails saying, did you, did you write this, have come up to me and said, uh, uh, either I approve thoroughly of your views or how could you have said this. And there is really absolutely nothing I can do about it. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say is that I think it is even more incumbent now on rep reputable journalists to make absolutely sure that the people who write for them are properly qualified and properly trained. Because the big plus point that reputable papers have now with the internet coming in is that people should turn to them because they know that amidst all the sewage and garbage which is there on the internet, here is something that I can trust. The need for trustworthiness is in a way even greater now because of the internet. And therefore, if, if um, newspapers are not insisting that their writers are properly trained, um, if they are loosely employing freelancers and people like that who they are not adequately sure about their knowledge, then I think they are undermining the very reason why they could and should play such an important role on the internet. At this point, I want to ask all of you, you know, this whole idea of trusting a journalist because he's qualified enough to gather his information. But then, how do you, you all of you have been associated with mainstream big media. And uh, if I were to believe whatever BBC was wa wanting to tell me or, you know, the Indian newspapers want to tell me about Kashmir, you know, I would, I, I know I'm not knowing the truth. I cannot trust them because there are certain agendas or certain policies that they are pursuing. And so how does one trust that? So that sort of, the other narrative always comes from these smaller places, you know, from, from this one independent blogger who had the courage to go and blog about something which he saw, but probably a journalist was not allowed to blog about, to write about that because his media house would not allow him to. Yeah. Well, there are, I mean, there are many sources of information and, and, and all you can do really is is, is is read them long enough to learn to trust them. I mean, I would trust uh, the BBC, I think, uh, um, pretty well wholly, not entirely, but I mean, everything has flaws and everything's fallible. Uh, I think the Guardian, well, I'm not just saying this because I work for it, but I think the Guardian is reasonably trustworthy in its facts. Um, I would think in this country, I would probably trust what was in the Telegraph. I would probably trust what was in the Hindu because they look serious. But that, I mean, I may be wrong in those judgments. Um, 
I would trust the New York Times because I think a lot of mainly not on things like the Iraq war. I mean, ev everything in the end is fallible. We can't trust everything. But you can learn to trust, I think, certain institutions, not wholly, but for a lot of the time. I mean, I don't trust myself a lot of the time, so why should you trust me? <laughs> I think there's going to be a structural reorganization um, within um, media, which will affect how we all um, gain knowledge. I, I, I get the sense that um, news, per se, is going to be centrally provided and farmed out um, by agencies, increasingly rather than newspapers, and that newspapers are going to curate um, original and independent voices. So if you look at um, Financial Times, is now a hugely successful global model by finding a niche audience with voices you can trust who have views that span the globe on the markets and other subjects increasingly. And news is becoming something that's bought from other sources. And I actually think that that may be a differentiator, that um, newspapers won't exist. What there will be is um, a galaxy of voices and writers who you are attracted to and may like and trust, and they will effectively be the character um, of the newspaper. What they're, um, what they're trying to do increasingly as well is become lifestyle clubs. So newspapers have club cards, and uh, they want you to... Uh, to, uh, to subscribe to the kind of ethos and culture of the newspaper, buy the tie, have the pants, um, wear the hat, and I kind of